His daughter said, what about Mr. No, just no. I want to make this short and sweet, but I have so much to say and also slurp. This smoothie was made like five years ago. Okay, maybe only an hour, but either way, this is what happens when I try to make something healthy. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. As the title tells, we're discussing Atlanta season three, episode four, perhaps tied for number one this season with episode two. Between those two, last episode was good, but this episode was way better. I was howling. I said, how? How could they do this? I have a theory. I'm gonna share it with you and I'm gonna share why at the end of this episode and you can let me know if you agree. My theory is, this is another one of Earn's dream sequences. Because the way I see it, episode one wraps up with Earn waking up. So that was all a dream, right? This episode, for many reasons, which I'll share at the end of this video, was giving the same type of tease. So let's talk about the plot. I'm also going to share story time. I usually do story time Saturdays. I've been off for the last couple of weeks. So I figured I'd share a little story time in the mix of this one to make up for it. And then we'll wrap up with my theories and predictions. I hope you guys enjoy this one. If you do, tap the like and let's go. So this episode opens up with this overhead of what sounds like a radio broadcast about what's happening. Switch up to the scene where someone else gets called ahead in line. I was confused by that. If anyone can break it down or if it was just another one of Atlanta's weird moments, let me know. But I didn't pay much mind. Then homeboy, the main character, I think his name is Marshall. If it's not, we're going to go with Marshall today. He goes to pick up his kid to take her to school. And he asked for a lamp. I said, Ikea's got a lamp over here thinking, you really need the lamp or are you trying to check the situation? Because the way I see it is, maybe he wants to go in the house to see if anything got rearranged. Maybe she's talking to someone and homeboy left a few things. Because there's no way you need a lamp. Especially when you go later on the episode and you see where he's staying. He's okay. He don't need that lamp. Driving the kid to work, listening to the radio broadcast. These two people are laughing about Tesla. And then it comes to the point where it's like, no, wait. This thing is actually going through. The idea of reparations. So it's funny that the writers of Atlanta chose Tesla. Because I remember working out and listening to one of my favorite pods. And I'm working out and I slowed down as I heard... <laughs> You can't make this ish up. There is a lawsuit. I think it's not even a month ago. I think it was actually two months ago because it was during Black History Month. There were several people, but one person in particular suing the factory managers at Tesla because they were using the N-word. In 2022 and Black History Month, no shame. Marshall turns off the radio real quick. He's not feeling it. Initially, I was listening more than watching this scene. You guys know I'm legally blind, so it takes a little bit of time for me to zoom in and see your facial expression. One thing I appreciate, I don't know who this actor is, but I do appreciate that he conveyed those slight split second intonations in his face so well. It was the non-caring, passive thinking to the kind of perking up and then letting it go. And his daughter starts to talk about how <laughs> her mom put on a perfume for him. And I said, don't you know the rule is what happens in this house stays in this house. And when you go with him, you don't bring back that stuff either. I wasn't sure if she was saying it because she wants her dad to come back home, which she asked him to just before she went to school. Or if her mom really did put on the perfume. And for all we know, maybe it was for her ex-husband or soon to be ex-husband or maybe her next man. Drops his daughter off at school, goes to work. I think that's when we start to see a mysterious car following him. I said... This is giving horror vibes. Atlanta never used to be the scary. What's going on here? Goes to work and as soon as the elevator doors open, I don't even know if they gave her a name this episode. If they did, I didn't catch it. Homegirl, main character. She says, meeting. He says, what for? Shrug shoulder. Literally me. Every time they'd call a meeting, I'd ask why. And then when the meeting was done, I'd still ask why. If you've ever worked a job where there's more than one meeting a week, why? Nine times out of 10, Everything that was spoken about in an hour could have been said in 30 seconds. That's what I think. They have this meeting. Someone shouts aloud. I said, dang, that's how this office is doing it. Next girl scratching herself all anxious. Sometimes the meetings do that, I guess. Mr. Nonchalant Marshall goes back to his desk. Then that same chick is asking him, did you do your ancestry yet? You know, 23 me, he's got a discount. She presses him about it and he's like, no, 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 I'm good. 
And at first, I respected that because I said, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. Homeboy is okay not knowing. If it'll be him, it's okay. Maybe he knows something we don't know yet. Then he says he's Austrian, Austri Austrian, Ukrainian, which we're going to talk about in a second because I think that is perfect timing and also super eerie. Someone else finds that they have 53% of this and I'm gi it's giving black mirror tees. One of the coworkers is like, look at them, they're carefree. I'm thinking all the times that I've worked a job and I felt like I couldn't afford to diddy daddle. <laughs> Who says that in 2022? I couldn't afford to slack off or be like that. I was never a water cooler girl. I never wasted time. I wouldn't come to work then go and get a coffee for half an hour, go on 55 smoke breaks because I know that people see a certain thing when they see my color and my gender. But it was funny that dichotomy there where they're looking with gazing eyes of it must be nice when it's just like every other day, it must be nice, right? This episode is gonna have a lot of people charged. I already know it. I don't know if it was the coworkers or the guy on the radio, but someone makes a joke about spending their money on Nike and a car. And I'm thinking, so you're gonna get your reparations and give it back. All of those companies you mentioned are hella problematic. And at the end of the day, a lot of cultures, their money will circulate within their community three to even 12 times, whereas studies have shown that the black dollar, if we're lucky, circulates one time before leaving the community. So you gotta support black owned businesses, but I digress. Back to the storyline, he goes to pick up his kid. The kid is complaining about, they called her a racist. I'm thinking about all the times that I was bullied for being black on the playground. I'm thinking if his daughter is getting it, his time is coming soon. <laughs> This was the funniest part in the episode when he said, do you see that we have slaves? And with the swiftness, she said, Mr. So it's <laughs> no, I pay him. All right. Okay. They get home. They're talking about dinner. It's a cute family moment. The door knocks, ratatata. The car that's been following them all day long. Apparently you've been served. And also Shanique was there to live stream the whole thing. Talking about she's coming to collect what's hers. She says 3 million. I don't know where she got that number from, but okay, sis, go off. And then when he slams the door, she's like, don't slam my door, okay? I respect you claiming what's yours. <laughs> he turns around and says, don't tell your mom. Of course she does, because the next scene, or maybe I'm skipping scenes, but when he interacts with his soon-to-be ex-wife, we need to get the divorce expeditiously because of what's going on with you. He's like, are you serious? She's like, I'm proven. You were away yesterday. That was another moment where I fell out. He goes to work the next day. He's on edge. He's not sure who knows. He goes to the washroom. The man has the reverse shirt, so in the reflection it shows, I owned slaves. When he sits down, old girl tells him, yeah, I think he got off easy. He just has to wear it on Sundays, twice a week. <laughs> so just laughing at the moment because she's claiming what gives her a disadvantage when, of course, up until this point, she was living off her privileges. And now she's like, yeah, he got off easy. It's like, who are you to decide? You're not the one to set the marker here, lady. But I loved her. She was the comic relief of the episode. Fast forward a little bit. He goes home and Shaniqua has the whole fam for the cookout. The guy runs him down the street in his car with no shoes. Is this paying homage to get out or something? I just, I said, leave that one alone. I'm not trying to decipher this. I was laughing because I said, no, they're not playing make it last forever in the background. That's my tune. <laughs> I guess he goes to a motel, then he goes down to have a drink. So I'll have what he's having. I'm looking at that guy that's sitting across from him, Eve for short. You look very familiar. Have I seen you in another show, a movie? Bing. That's the same dude that was sitting in the boat in episode one. And that is why I think this is a dream sequence. I'm gonna share my story time and how I felt a little triggered during this episode. <sighs> praying hands because I want to make sure I say what I need to say clearly and precisely and poignantly. So I, I, topics about race rub people the wrong way, especially when you don't relate. About a year ago, I was talking to a friend We're talking about the education system here in Canada and the US. I spun it to race because I was listening to a podcast earlier that day or the day before. When am I not listening to podcasts? How they're preventing students from going to certain schools and also even suing parents for putting different addresses because they don't want them going to their schools with better education. I understand the ethics of it because class sizes and funding and whatever, but it comes down to this basis of certain schools, whether here or in the States, don't get the same amount of funding and also happen to have a certain amount of minorities. And as we were talking about this, she 
came to this point where she's like, I don't understand what the problem is. Like slavery happened a long time ago. No offense, you guys need to let it go. In my personal opinion, no offense is the same as but in a sentence. Whatever you said before the but or the no offense is a race. Wusa. Because of course this is my friend, but I also feel like it's not my duty as a black person to have to explain to you why what you said is A, highly inappropriate and B, completely insensitive. But because she was my friend, I decided to explain to her that it's not about letting the past go. And as much as it may seem to her that black people are angry or holding a grudge, it's not even that. It's that the ramifications of over 400 years of slavery still have an effect in present day. And this episode so beautifully illustrated that. When Shaniqua was outside with the megaphone, making it known that homeboy owned her great, great, great grandfather, she said something so simple and beautiful, like, how much does your job pay? You probably get paid more than me. The advantages of having that money tree is what led to him being able to acquire and access things more easily than her counterparts or her herself. And it can't be disputed when you look at educations and the fact that there's affirmative action now because there's been so many ways and undercurrents of them preventing certain ethnicities from being able to even have a level playing ground with the differences of loans or certain cultures not even being able to access loans and people not being able to live in certain parts of the city or different states. The, they'll devalue the property. Just imagine, they say slavery is abolished. Then because you live in the South and you don't want to stop what you're doing, you just pretend like your iPhone wasn't on data and you didn't get the message. And you keep doing it for five more years and then you do get Jim Crow. It's so disturbing and I didn't have enough time to explain to this friend all of the intricacies that I've taken time to learn and I just wish that people who said these things would spend a fraction of the time that I take to get to learn about these things, but that's never gonna be. You can tell I'm not hopeful here. There was a couple other instances where comments were made and I just thought, I know I'm legally blind, but I'm not sure, maybe you need to get your eyes checked because you can't be fixing yourself to say this straight face to a black woman. Also, this person is an ethnicity of European descent that's Northeastern that has been persecuted in the past. So with that history in your background, I figured you would at least somewhat relate, resonate or understand instead of kind of brush it off. And that's what kind of triggered me in this episode because when these people were looking at their scorecards for their ancestry, it's kind of like, am I on the okay side of privilege or am I on the other side of privilege? And that really reminded me of that episode of Black Mirror where that girl went through her day and the more mistakes she made, the more points she lost until she ended up in jail. We miss the point when we want to separate ourselves from the problem instead of realize reparations are not about being divisive. I'm not taking back what's mine. I'm owed this. It's very different. It's not an aggressive thing. It's not as aggressive as slavery was, let me tell you. And when you think about the man going through the divorce and how the wife didn't want to lose her assets and the mess Marsha was going through, it's similar to black couples being divided in plantations and not being able to build a family network. If there's a black man in the house, even if he doesn't make enough because he's not able to get a job because there's so much disparity out there and racism, advantage his family by staying in the house because then the woman is not able to get access to different types of funds in order to supplement her earnings to help feed her children. The whole thing is a totally disturbing cycle. If you actually take the time to read it and not just say welfare queen, which is what friend said one night and I just said this one I ain't going to try to explain it's a specific created ideology to demonize an ethnicity for getting the same help that another ethnicity was getting for years without being demonized for you just goodbye goodbye and while we're on that note we're gonna wrap back to episode three because there were so many things I missed in last week's reaction that I wanna share with you guys. I don't know if you clued into it. I didn't see in the comment section, but thank you to the person that pointed out to me that Van's storyline went into the mid end credits. I need to go back and watch it. But one thing I realized, cause that tree, you know me, plant lady, I was just like, I'm about this tree, something about this tree, it's haunting, it's haunting. That's the trees that they used to lynch people on. So homeboy had that direct delivered Amazon Prime planted in the middle of his establishment plus Anandos is across the street why didn't i clue into that fried chicken and watermelon 
are both things that black people used in the Jim Crow era as entrepreneurs to incur revenue, feed their families, build businesses. They were actually quite lucrative with it. They, it wasn't so much that they were consuming it in excess and they were lazy and fat and just eating fried chicken and sleeping on hammocks. They were using these things as a way of garnering income. When the Southern whites saw this, they decided to demonize, like they did with the welfare queen, this idea that fried chicken is for the fat and the lazy and watermelon. That's all these people eat is watermelon. And that's where these tropes of Kool-Aid and watermelon and fried chicken come from. These were actually things that we were using to lift ourselves up. They decided to give it a bad connotation to pull it back down. And the more you research the tiny things like that, the more sad you get with society. The man that was in the boat and also I'll have what you're drinking comes over to chat with him and so profound with it. When you sit down with the moment, it's an entire culture of people who've been able to have that head start at life based on and off the backs of others back in the past and present day. I'm not here to guilt people. That's not the point of this video. It's just to call a spade a spade. This is history. I'm as much a part of it as someone else is. So it's not like I'm pointing blame. And again, for the third time, reparations for me is not about being divisive or separatist or taking. It's just balance. I didn't even know what to say when E got up after saying all those profound things to Marshall. And then you hear, boom the episode was done but then they go to another sequence where it seems like someone's late to work they got their backpack on then i hear in the background your girl worked in a restaurant way too long longer than i admit that pre-shift rant and they have a line where they have to talk about what reparations they gotta pay and the first guy says 10 percent. then when our character comes up he says 15 they're all like ouch <laughs> And I think about it, if he was working his corporate job, would 15 be as bad and as dramatic? But he comes back with a swiftness and he says those tips, though, and that's true. What the government can't tax, you can keep. So, I mean, you're not that bad off. What I loved is the scene that we pan out as black people being served, literally and figuratively, but a more mixed and, in my words, balanced environment. As I said, I worked in restaurants way too long. And nine times out of 10, it'd be black people slaving in the kitchen for minimum wage. And they usually didn't get tip out. And for those of you who've never worked in the industry, tip out is a percentage of what the server makes. Now it's very controversial. Should the server have to pay? If they have to pay anyone, I would say the kitchen staff because they're the one who's making the food. If there's no food, there's no restaurant. What is that? That's a lounge or drink. And to share another story, which I already shared. So if you're a subscriber here, you know this quick story time. I remember someone came into the restaurant that I worked at in this neighborhood, and it's a predominantly white neighborhood, but most people don't give racist, at least not overtly. Anyways, this lady came in, and we're this, and we're that, and we're this, and we're that. That's how I knew she wasn't okay. One of the things she said was, you people shouldn't be here at the front. I turned my head slowly thinking, so it's okay if I'm in the back making your food or running or cleaning up, but not to be in the front. Hmm. Noted. She wasn't well, but I think a lot of people who have their screws on a little more tight have that sentiment. They think they're not racist. They believe that because they haven't done anything directly, they've ignored things that they're not a part of the problem. And again, I'm not here to blame or divide. I'm just saying accountability is key in everything. You know me. I'm always talking about that on the podcast. I can't believe they went off with this one. This is one for the record books. They did chef's kiss. Well, well, well done. I loved it and I can't wait for next week. I'm guessing, because since my theory is that this was a dream sequence, that next week is gonna be back in Europe with the gang and then maybe the episode after will be another dream sequence or maybe that's it. This, this is all we're getting in, into Ern's head. As an Antiguan Jamaican who was born in Canada, if there were reparations in the States, I, I wouldn't get that. I don't know as a Canadian Caribbean, if I'd say run me that money, as much as I'd say my cousins deserve to be run that money. I just, I don't know, that's, oof, I feel like we're going down some territory here because who gets it, who doesn't, oh my gosh. Let me just wrap up the episode here. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, tap the like. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later. One point that I don't want to forget, it's so little, but I think it's super important, but I'm Austrian Ukrainian. She's like, that happened a long time ago. I've heard that one before. That joke was so dark. I said, I can't even laugh it out. But then I was also thinking Ukraine, 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 present day, and how quite a bit of people are noticing the shift of empathy and quickness versus 
what happened with Syrians and Afghans recently, and we can go back to other nationalities too, but there's something to be said about the complexity of complexion. I'm not going to say anymore because someone's definitely going to come for me for that. 